when we talk about inflammation, so inflammation, it can either be caused by an infectious cause or a non-infectious cause. That's the big two classifications we'll talk about in a separate video. But an infection would be something like maybe strep throat, and so you'd have an infection in the lining of your throat. Or it can be non-infectious, like an immune cell disorder, where cells from your immune system attack normal tissue because there's some marker there that causes them to fight or flock to that site. Sometimes even if you have damage to the tissue, like trauma, immune cells will flock there and try and fix the broken tissue, but may cause more damage than good because of all the swelling and other things that are associated with it. So let's talk about the other things right here in addition to swelling because inflammation has four cardinal signs that are associated with it and I promise it's easy to remember because they all sound like the number four so the first one is called tumor or tumor and you know it as just a form of cancer or a mass and that's more generally what it means it just means a swelling or a mass somewhere where it shouldn't be swollen so a site that becomes inflamed will start swelling, two more. It'll also have color. So if you speak Spanish, you might recognize that color looks a lot like caliente. And so all that means is that you'll get a certain degree of warmth. And that's related to a release of chemicals from the immune cells from the site that they're infiltrating. Or you can also have what's called dolor, dolor, which... Again, if you understand some Spanish, you'll recognize as the word for pain. So dolor means pain and also rhymes with the number four. So of course, you'll have pain at a site of inflammation. And finally, the last cardinal sign of inflammation I'll write down here is rubor, rubor, which all that means is redness. And I think this is a better sign for a skin infection because you can see the redness from maybe a spider bite or something like that. You probably won't be able to see it for an internal organ like the heart. So we won't talk too much about it here, but just know that that's the fourth of the four cardinal signs. And just to make sure you don't feel like you're gypped, sometimes there's a fifth cardinal sign we're not gonna talk about here, but it's a very fancy term that's called functuolasia. And all that means is a loss of function. And that's from very advanced inflammation. So for right now, we'll talk about inflammation in some of its earlier stages when we have the ability to intervene and treat myocarditis myocarditis again inflammation of the heart muscle or the myocardium or pericarditis pericarditis inflammation of the linings around the heart pericarditis and a few of these signs and symptoms I'm about to mention will be present in both myocarditis and pericarditis. But I'll be sure to let you know when we talk about the sign or symptom that helps discriminate between myocarditis and pericarditis. So first of all, two more, or a swelling of immune cells locally, will cause what's called a pericardial, pericardial friction rub. And this will happen in both myocarditis and pericarditis. So it's a myocardial friction rub. And all that means is that the two layers, two layers of serous pericardium, so the two layers of the serous pericardium you can see. So the two layers of the serous pericardium rub together. And when they rub together, they make an unusual noise. When you've heard of heartbeats or when you've heard your own heartbeat or somebody else's heartbeat, you hear a lub and then a dub, lub dub. But when you have a pericardial friction rub, instead, it sounds like two pieces of leather scratching together. That's how people have described it. There's a scratch where you have the lub, and then there's an early on scratch at the beginning of the dub, and then a second scratch at the end of the dub. So you don't even hear the dub or the lub anymore. So it's more like scratch, scratch, scratch. And this happens, for example, in myocarditis, when you have a bunch of immune cells infiltrate the myocardium and expand this heart wall. And what that does is it forces the pericardium layers, the serous pericardium layers, to rub together. And so when the heart beats and then relaxes and fills with blood, 
it'll cause those two layers to scratch together. Similarly, with pericarditis, inflammation of one or both layers of the serous pericardium will cause them to more readily rub together when the heart fills with blood. Okay, beyond that, the invading immune cells that show up in your myocardium or your pericardium, these invading immune cells, may show up and disrupt the electrical signals of the heart. So they can disrupt the electrical signals of the heart. And this becomes a big problem because if it happens at an earlier point of the myocardium, whether it's the inflammation of the myocardium or the pericardium that's inflamed and then pressing back on the myocardium, this can then disrupt flow of an electrical signal further down to the rest of the heart. And that could produce what's called tachycardia. Tachycardia, which all that means, so the cardia part right here, cardia means heart, tachy just means fast or elevated, so you'll get an elevated heart rate. An elevated heart rate. And just to drive this home, here you can see a normal heart that's beating and this redness here indicates how the signal starts up here in this node and then spreads down, so here we go, spreads down right here and then comes back up. Everything you see in gray right here, all of this, except for this part and on upwards, that's the aorta, everything down below here is the myocardium. And so if you have an inflammation, let's say right here, as you can see, you can't have the signal pass down that way or even return up when it repolarizes. And we'll talk more about that when we discuss EKGs. But for right now, just know that if there's inflammation here, it blocks the conduction of the electrical signal. And this is a beautiful, what's called electrocardiogram wave right here, which just shows how the heart is responding from the conduction of the electrical signal, first through the atria, the ventricles, and then as the ventricles relax right here. And we'll talk more about that when we discuss how we diagnose myocarditis and pericarditis. So away with this video, be gone. And let's move on here to color. And so I sort of already mentioned that these immune cells that infiltrate the myocardium or the pericardium, these guys will release chemicals. So immune cells release, I'll just write chems, chemicals that then spread and cause warmth locally in the heart and the pericardium. But these chemicals can also go up to a part of the brain that regulates the body's temperature. And it can elevate the set point of the body temperature, resulting in a fever. And so that's why if you've got myocarditis or pericarditis, it's an inflammatory process that involves your whole body. But if you want to tell the difference between myocarditis and pericarditis, pain is where the dolor, or the dollar, the dolor, haha, is at. And there are two different types of pain that you would have. One type with myocarditis, and a very different type with pericarditis. In myocarditis, you're going to end up having persistent pain. Pain that exists no matter what your posture or your position is, persistent pain. And this is because the immune cells we talked about earlier, the immune cells invade your very nerve-rich, so I'll write nerve-rich myocardium. So the nerve-rich myocardium, as you recall from that animation I just showed you, there are a lot of nerves that are present to make sure we convey an electrical signal to all parts of our heart muscle. And so when these immune cells invade here and they impinge on the nerves, you've got persistent pain or pain that exists as long as these nerves are being pressed on by the invading immune cells. In contrast, for pericarditis, what you end up getting is something that's called precordial, precordial chest pain. Precordial chest pain. And this sounds like a fancy term, but just know that core just means heart. So precordial means before the heart, which is a reference to the pericardium. So precordial chest pain occurs when you have a very stiff, so a very stiff pericardium. So this very stiff pericardium that's inflamed. So this stiff pericardium will press on the heart. And just as I mentioned, the heart, the myocardium especially, is very nerve-rich. So any impingement on the heart is very painful. 
And so as long as the pericardium is pressing on the heart, you have a lot of pain. But one of the interesting things about the anatomy of the heart is that it's anchored posteriorly or to the back. The heart has a ligament that holds it to your spine or backward. And so if you lean forward, if you lean forward and cause the pericardium to fall away with gravity from the heart, you actually end up having less pain. So relief with leaning forward. And so that's how you can tell the difference between myocarditis and pericarditis. If it's pain that's relieved by leaning forward, that's classic for precordial chest pain and is more likely suggestive of pericarditis than myocarditis, where you would have persistent pain. And that's a very key clinical distinction. And then finally, another type of pain that you can get or a type of chest pain that you can have, this infiltration of immune cells. So I'll just call that the infiltrate. So this infiltrate can change the shape of whatever it's invading, right? We talked about that already with tumor or the swelling that happens. And so we can infiltrate the myocardium to cause it to swell, or we can infiltrate the pericardium to cause it to become stiff and swollen as well. And when we do that, it makes it difficult for the myocardium to work correctly. And so it limits the amount of blood. So let's say it limits amount of blood that can be pumped out of the heart. And you can definitely see this to be true with pericarditis because when the pericardium becomes stiff, the heart isn't able to fill with all the blood that's returning to it. And so effectively it pumps out less blood to your circulatory system. And in fact, a few of the first vessels that branch off that main vessel that conveys blood to the rest of the body, that it's called the aorta, there are what's called coronary arteries that deliver oxygenated blood to the heart. So even the heart doesn't get oxygen to its tissues. And I think you might recognize that when the heart isn't receiving oxygen, it undergoes what's called ischemia, or what's happening is ischemia, which means a lack of oxygen. And ischemia in the heart results in a, I think you guessed it, a heart attack. So that's why it's very important to diagnose these disorders because you could cause a heart attack if they're left alone to follow their natural progression. And then finally, to be concise, as I mentioned, rubor, we can't see the heart as an external organ, so we're not going to talk about any signs or symptoms that could happen here. But these other three are very helpful to assist us in thinking about all the different signs and symptoms that you can have with myocarditis or pericarditis.